this journey ever ends, if ever, if we ever feel the land and still we breathe, see the sun, still, still the time must come when we have curators, Professor Anthony Bogus and Miss uh, Abigail Van Bogues. Ms. Shana Weinberg, Professor Crane Sudin, DVC, UCT, uh, professors uh, from the various academic communities, Mr. John Seve, National Librarian, Ezekiel Council, Ezekiel Senior Executive and Senior Management Team, members of the media, curators, um, from the Social History Centre, honoured guests, special friends, ladies and gentlemen. December is a very important month for us in our heritage as it marks Emancipation Day on the first and the International Day of the Abolition of Slavery on the second. Thus, nationally and internationally, we commemorate the ending of a brutal society slavery. We remember those who sacrifice, whose sacrifices contributed to the building of slaves <coughs> by Cape Town. In keeping with the theme of the slave lodge, from human wrongs to human rights, it is only fitting that we welcome the exhibition, Ships of Bondage and the Fight for Freedom, curated by Professor Anthony Bogues and Michelle Weinberg from the Centre for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University. Ships of Bondage and the Fight for Freedom examine the global networks involved in the slavery trade during the period of European colonial empires. This exhibition provides a unique opportunity for a comparative study between bondage in the Atlantic world and South Africa. Significantly in this exhibition, the narrative includes the voice of the enslaved as they resisted abroad the slave ships, the Amistad, the Sally, and the Myanmar. The resistors abroad the Myanmar who survived only to experience recapture in all probability lived the rest of their lives in this very building denied the freedom they fought for. We understand this to be a project of unique significance and are delighted to be hosting this exhibition from the Center for the Slave, a Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University. Ships of Bondage is a poignant reminder of the significance of struggles for freedom and of the need to ensure the basic human rights of all a theme central to the slave launch. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Ezeko Museums of South Africa, I am pleased to welcome you this evening to the slave launch and the opening of the exhibition Ships of Bondage and the Fight for Freedom. Um, I would like to introduce Professor Tony Bogues to you all. Tony is the Lynn Cross Professor of Social Sciences and Critical Theory and Director for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University. He is also, amongst his many visitorships, Visiting Professor of the Humanities at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia and Honorary Professor at the Centre for African Studies at our own university here in Cape Town, UCT. His major research and writing interests are intellectual and cultural history, radical political thought, critical theory, Caribbean and African politics and literature, amongst several strands of his pursuits. I also know of his passion and love of reggae and Rastafarianism, which is mentioned in passing in his CV, and I hope that in the not too distant future that we can do a shared project with Tony in social history. Tony has such an interesting CV that I think there's no danger of me boring you by mentioning some of his publications, for instance, which are uniquely important for South Africans 
as they reach out across the diaspora and which give a real sense of the interests and intellectual pursuits of Tony. His publications include Caliban's Freedom, The Early Political Thought of C.L.R. James, 1997, Black Heretics and Black Prophets, Radical Political Intellectuals, 2003, and Empire and Liberty, Power, Freedom and Desire, 2010. He's also edited two volumes of Caribbean Intellectual History, after Main Towards the Human, Critical Essays in the Thought of Sylvia Winter, 2006, and the George Lamming Reader, The Aesthetics of Decolonization, 2010. Uh, thank you uh, very, very much. Um, I would say it's a, if I could begin with one small correction, which I begin because it's not yet off the internet. <laughs> Um, but that the, that I think is important is that I was uh, along with my colleague in the audience, David Scott, from the phone in uh, Associate Editors of um, Small Acts, but that no longer is so. As I said, I always like to make a correction because it's not taken off the CD, off the internet, as I think that's a mistake. Um, I wish to, I, I want to say good afternoon to the world, good, uh, good evening, good evening to. Um, all the distinguished ladies and gentlemen here, uh, friends and colleagues. And I want to begin with thanks. The list is long, but an international collaboration of this sort means many partners and moving parts. And I wish to try and acknowledge all the various institutions who we work with. The idea of this exhibition really emerged in late 2012 when I was appointed the inaugural director of the Center for the Slavery and Justice at Brown University. At that time, I had a chance meeting with Mr. John Weinberg about the mirror and wondered then whether or not we could then have an exhibition in South Africa about three ships, the Amistad, the Sally, and the Miriam. This idea gained legs when in the center's first workshop, <clears throat> we invited the Ezekiel Museum to send a representative in, uh, who would attend in one of the first things we had. And what we were trying to do at that workshop was to have a discussion of what I like to call the public curriculum. And in trying to develop this idea of the public curriculum around questions of slavery, justice, and freedom, we face a very formidable problem. And that is the problem which many curators face. That is, how does one represent slavery? All exhibitions, as we know, are about some forms of representations. And as we know, that there are always gaps in different forms of representation. So curators of slavery and of situations of extreme historical violence, of what I have called historical catastrophe, have to grapple with this particular problem of trying to represent what sometimes we cannot name or sometimes something that we have inadequately named and to describe it as a form of representation. So anyway, we had this as part of our, if you wish, remit. And we invited the Ezekiel Museum to send a representative to share their experiences at them. And this has led to the former collaboration and to the exhibition which is downstairs in the middle of this room. So I want to thank the social history uh, department of Ezekiel. <coughs> and I would like to thank all the staff members of the social history and of the slave lodge and all the persons who work with us. And really say thanks very much and really single out the, uh, the people who they are, but to single out the, the, the installers in particular. Because those of you who do exhibitions know that it is very nice to have conceptualized, very nice to have the design. It takes months, it takes years. But when it comes to now beginning to install, then that's where rubber hit the road, so to speak. <laughs> And we had in, in, in the installation some of the finest persons that I have worked with 
in, as, as I have tried to lead a, some kind of curating life. I also would like to acknowledge, as our partners in this particular project, the University of Cape Town, um, where I'm honorary professor, who has provided support. The Center for African Studies, where I was work and teach sometimes, which has also provided support. The Makeda School of Art, and the Center for Curated Archive, which has provided tremendous support, really tremendous support, for this particular uh, project. And all these party partners that I have worked with, uh, or we have worked with, did not only do we wish labor, man, quote unquote, manual labor, the necessary task of putting together an exhibition, but also did a lot of conceptual work. We try to work collaboratively by sending stuff out to people who we are working with, asking them back for criticism and feedback, and then we have a dialogue and discussions about, the, about what it is that is, is there to be curated. Finally, though, I would like to give my warmest thanks to my co-curator, Ms. Shane Weinberg, um, who work, has worked with me and who is a person who, over the last year, I have worked with on two, um, on two, uh, two exhibitions, the much, a much larger version of the one that is there, um, and who we actually um, <coughs> sent to her uh, when, 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 we, um, when, when we spoke this week and I was coming back into Cape Town, that we now have another set of projects over the next couple of, um, next couple of years. So Ms. Weinberg is, it's, um, I really would like to thank her publicly for, for doing a lot of uh, this work. And also to thank Ms. Eva Cook, who is the Center for Slavery and Justice, who's um, first fellow in the Public Humanities. The Center has what we call a Public Humanities Fellow, and she's the first fellow. And part of that Public Humanities Fellow's remit is to work with us um, in this business of the public curriculum. Now having said all these facts, let me turn to my remarks, which are really about reflections on slavery and freedom. <coughs> and I say them mindful of being in a building that used to house slaves, the company slaves. And say that mindful of being in a building which moved from being a place that housed slaves to a place that was the colonial government building, to a library, then to a Supreme Court, <coughs> and a court in which some trials of a couple of people who were slaves were held, or people who were associated, well, who were descendants of slaves were held. Perhaps what I'm going to say may seem strange to some. I want to reflect on slavery and freedom from a particular point of view, one which is almost impossible to proceed from, one where questions of archive and memory abound, and one which not many historians think about, the questions of slavery and freedom from the standpoint of the slave. I do not claim to be embodying the slave, nor embodying his or her consciousness, or in a kind of act of discomfort ventriloquism, talking about and thinking with the slave. Rather, I want to think about this business of the slave, what is the slave and what it means to the slave, and the questions of freedom in relationship to slavery, by thinking, beginning to think about two novels. One, Andre Brink's novel, The Leader, and the other one, Tony Morrison's Beloved. One wants to begin briefly to think about slavery, therefore, in a slightly different way, not just about the social structures of slavery, the social systems of slavery, which are themselves of extreme importance, but really to try and think about slavery as a set of human experiences, human practices, and human interactions that, in fact, then create these social systems and these, if you wish, uh, structures. So therefore, I want to reflect a bit about the slave. And here, I'm also not thinking about the extraordinary horrors of slavery, or as a specific form of human domination. Rather, I want to think about slavery as a certain kind part of human history, or which I wish to call colonial modernity. That is slavery as a part of colonial modernity. In other words, I want to suggest 
that one cannot historically understand or grapple with colonialism without slavery. And then to suggest to you that both slavery and colonialism were absolutely essential in the shaping of the modern world. I do that because, and as beginning from a historical point of view, if you wish, in quotation marks, because I believe that history is about an engagement, a human engagement with time. That it is we who make history in time. And that in, and that in this process of time, as we make history, we leave what I like to call sedimented deposits. And that in the, for to think about slavery and to think about freedom is to think about these deposits and the traces which these deposits may have left and which may continue to haunt us. Glenn Morrison, in her interview about the number 1998 novel, Beloved, says this. She says the book is about these so-called anonymous people we call slaves. What they do to keep on, how they make a life, what are they willing to risk in order to relate to one another. In other words, she's trying to think about a way in which to recall the ordinariness, if you wish, of people who are involved in slavery as they attempt to construct themselves and human beings in an extraordinary situation of oppression. For Marston, as many of us know, the business that the novel beloved is really about a ghost, the ghost of slavery. And it is also about a certain kind of remembering, a memory of slavery that becomes very, very important. It is important to note that while the beloved speaks to us through ghosts and memory, Andre Brinks Felida, 2012, wants us to understand that slavery in South Africa is an immediate thing. It touches family, his family, and that by touching families, Brink wants to draw our attention to his deposits, to his traces, not just in blood, but in the society. Felida knits and knits and knits because she is herself a piece of knitting that is knitted by somebody else. In the Brinks's novel, we find one of the most astute understandings of what it means to be a slave. Felido says, this is what she says, this is what it is to be a slave, that everything is decided for you from out there. You just have to listen, do, do as they tell you. You don't say no, you don't ask questions, you do what they tell you. But we might very well ask, okay, this is history. And this is that kind of story. It's a world about the past, and a past that has gone. And yes, we should learn lessons from it. Because it is history, it is a time past. So why study or why think about slavery? My response to you would be that history is also about the present. That there is a past, yes. But if you think about the past as sedimented deposits, then two things become important to us. Firstly, what traces and what deposits are present and how they shape the present. And secondly, why is it in the present do questions, issues appear in ways that they seem not to, uh, that they seem to have been forgotten or when or if they appear, we sometimes attempt to elide them. It would seem to me that slavery, that anonymous slave, is often elided, is often consigned to a long ago Mr. Pass, because perhaps in many ways, this business of slavery in the colonial world, in the Cape Colony, in Brazil, in the Caribbean, in the United States, that this business of a foreign form of human domination raises a set of fundamental questions about our so-called modern, about modernity, and perhaps some of those questions still echo and still resonate with us, not in the same form, but perhaps those questions are things that we might need to think about. I must say here, <coughs> we are still grappling with slavery. What is not that naive? Rather, I am suggesting to you that some of the questions posed by racial slavery, by colonial slavery, posed by colonial domination, are alive 
even though they are operating and appearing in different guises. Let me think about or take two. The first is race. In the history of thought and the practices of human domination, we can trace slavery in many societies. We can go back, if you wish, to European civilizations and to <coughs> Aristotle, and the way in which Aristotle talked about some people as natural slaves. We can talk about how this business of people being natural slaves, or the idea of people as natural slaves, how that then becomes a set of part of a set of justifications for colonial and racial slavery, <coughs> the idea that some people naturally are slaves. What is important, I think, though, to note about colonial, colonial and racial slavery is the emergence of a certain kind of human bodies organized around race. In other words, how racialized bodies becomes markers of what and who is human and who is not. In South Africa's history, which you all know better than I do, there is a current, one current of thinking that disconnects the emergence of racialized thought and practices in South Africa from slavery, arguing that there is a way in which questions of race and racialization appears with full force in the 1800s, in the industrialization period, and in the beginning of the 20th century, with the, 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 uh, the, 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 the South African Native Act. Part of the argument is that this, the slaves in South Africa were multinational slave bodies from Indonesia, and Africa, and elsewhere, which the VOC, which is a really a very important, and I'm always with the, the VOC, it's, it's, it's like I could just pause here. It is, it's some, it's some, one of the rare things in the Atlantic world that we don't spend time thinking about the VOC. There's a linguistic thing, so it's in dark, so we kind of, you know, don't pay much, much, much attention to the VOC. But uh, I was in Amsterdam last week on my way here and um, giving a series of seminars, and I had uh, visited a I mean, um, guest of a couple of museums and spent quite a bit of time in museums. And one of the things that fascinated me was that in the National Museum, I never saw the word colonialism. What I saw was Dutch overseas. <laughs> so whether it was about Suriname, whether it was about Java, or whatever, it was about the Dutch overseas. And of course, the business of colonialism was not mentioned at all. And that's fascinating, even in the story of the so-called golden age of the Dutch. Um, and it's about, again, the Dutch overseas. But what, what, what is fascinating that is about that is that the BOS, the BOC, it was the really some people have considered to be the first multinational. But let me continue. Part of the argument about a certain kind of disconnection is that there is a way in which the VOC bought to the Cape Colony multinational slave bodies, partly because they were involved in slave trade elsewhere, in Indonesia, as I said, and in Africa. And they brought them to the Cape, to the Cape Colony. And therefore, the question of racialized bodies was really not, if you wish, uppermost in people's mind. But listen, if you wish, to some of the arguments made in the Legislative Council in Cape, in the Cape Colony, about whether or not to import after 1834-35 prize in Negroes. This is how one of the arguments runs. They would be decisively prejudicial, the argument goes, goes, to the hewers of wood and drawers of water already in our colony. They would, one council member said, retard our civilization. End of quote. Then there's a fellow called John Edgar, and this is what he says. Why we, again in the council, the furious debate that goes on for a couple of weeks, why we profess to be desirous of importing intelligent labor Mr. John, John says, we are again, as in the days of yore, days of yesterday, importing savages to be our domestics and our laborers. John also makes the point that the Indians, he says, are actually uh, weak, but they have what he calls good limbs. And then he then makes the point that really, that all people except whites or human beings are essential savages. 
What we have here, and this is in the 1842 debate, in the minutes of the Legislative Council, what we have here, therefore, are already operating a notion as a schema, and a schema of hierarchy that is, if you wish, based on some kind of racial understanding. So that I'm afraid there is no South African exceptionalism here. There was, of course, a multinational slave population. But the questions of peoples, of hierarchies, who is human and who is not, and therefore the issues of rights, this was at the heart of the colonial slavery in the Cape. And therefore, if we see that history is related to time, and that it is about traces, then we might need to ask on what basis did the colonial power determine those hierarchies, and then what, how did it institute these hierarchies as thought, as ideas, as belief, and more importantly, perhaps, as practices. So here is a slave. He or she is a non-being, a thing. What does he or she do? How does he or she create life, create community, if you wish? Typically, our first answer to this is that there was resistance. And we, we talk about, therefore, rebellions and resistance as a sign that the slaves were human too. And that is necessary. I would argue, very necessary work. But here, here I would argue, there's something else that needs to happen that is perhaps more difficult work. Sylvia Winter, a Caribbean theorist, in the 1960s, in an article on John, called Junkin, talks about the slaves and ordinary people, she says, and here I paraphrase her, populating the lived spaces and landscapes of the world. <coughs> and they, she, they populate it with their gods, with their spirits, their dances, and their stories, creating often, I would argue, a counter-symbolic world. This is a difficult point for the historian and for the curator. How to represent this world? In other words, we may be able to represent, in quotation marks, the structures, but the world that the slave created, the complex meanings of this world, and what it tells us about slavery, that is the work that I argue is still left to be done. There are, of course, certain historians who have done, attempted to do this. We can name George Rowling, Rowling works in Sun Up to Sun, Sun Down to Sun Up. Uh, and, and in the United States, or Fred Kennedy's remarkable historical novel on the Jamaican slave, Sun Shah. But the question is not simply, okay, we now need more slave stories. Rather, it is also that we need to ask ourselves a question that the slaves, the unfreed, have to ask. And that question is, what is freedom? Or, let me put that another way, the way in which Fendiga puts it in Brink's novel. This is what she says. But far at the back of your head, you think, soon there must come a day when I can say for myself, this and that I shall do, this and that I shall not do. So this ability to do things, to come to, through one's own volition, becomes obviously a part of freedom. In addition, in the South African case, it is, we have to think about it in relation to, to questions of suicide and of marriage. And we also have to think about when we ask the question of freedom, what kind of answers did the slave give? In the exhibition, we will see that the slave from Madagascar, who leads the uprising on not the mutiny, this is what people say in this history books, this is this, the ships are called. The history of that documents these ships and revolts on these ships call them mutinies. And what they, from the Amistad to the Merriman to the Sally. And what they do is essentially follow the category of mutiny that the actual captain does, because the captain has the rights, so and he writes a lot we had a mutiny, etc. And so we as historians are looking to say the mutiny on the ships. I would want to argue that these are actually fights of freedom and rebellion. And what a question that the slaves of the Miriam, led by Masavane from Madagascar, asked for freedom was that basically he wanted to go home. He and the rest of the slaves wanted to go home. So for them, at that specific point in time, freedom. Freedom meant going home. 
My point here, therefore, is that there is a question of freedom that is, uh, if you wish, continues to be asked, although the answer may be different in different contexts, in different situations. And that obviously is, uh, if you wish, is obvious. But there are also other, if you wish, other paths of freedom that we need to think about. And these are, and here when we do this, two things arise. Firstly, how is it and what is it? If you wish, does the freedom, the history of freedom, and more importantly, the history of the practice of freedom emerges? And is there one history? Are there many histories of these practices of freedom? And secondly, paying attention to the period of decolonization and what one might call the anti colonial movements. We want to ask ourselves how did the anti colonial movements drive become one in which it was about simply political freedom or encapsulated, if you wish, in Kwame Nkrumah's phrase, seek ye first the political kingdom. To deal with the first, the question of freedom practices and its histories <coughs> in the early period of an emergence of colonial modernity. It is important here to note that freedom in colonial modernity emerges around the questions of politics. Emerges essentially into the American Revolution and notions of political liberty. And therefore, freedom becomes primarily something that is seen within the political realm. We don't have time to, to go rehearse the entire political philosophy and political ideas and thoughts that emerge at that time that points to this particular uh, phenomenon. What I think is interesting to understand is that the way in which freedom emerges as a preoccupation of politics <coughs> and liberty does so because it cannot face, the question of freedom cannot face the business of racial slavery in United slave States. And therefore, questions of freedom related only to politics detaches itself from slavery and therefore freedom becomes a practice of, if you wish, certain kinds of politics. If you disbelieve me, you just have to read two different documents. One, you just have to read the actual, some of the meetings of the founding fathers of the United States, particularly in the places of Massachusetts Council, where they were arguing for freedom and saying, we don't want to be slave to the king, meaning King George. And if you put that document alongside the slave petitions of Prince Hall, who says we don't want to be a slave, you're getting two different things. One doesn't want to be a slave, and we can understand slavery as something political relating to his or her sovereignty in relationship to the king. The other one will understand slavery as something fundamentally different related not just to sovereignty, but to a form of human domination. And I didn't quite understand this, quite frankly, until one day I was in the library looking at abolitionist papers and I came up on a box myself and this, this Weinberg in the library when we were trying to get some stuff together for an exhibition and I came up on a box and it was a box of the abolitionist movement in the United States and it was a box that many of us who go to church would know it's like a collection box with the money inside it and the box was something that the abolitionists they had, and they took it to various churches, because the abolitionists were also Christians, serious Christians, and people would put money inside it, and some of that money would be used as manumission money for some slaves. But what fascinated me and gave me pause, I was never working in I was silent for five minutes, five whole <laughs> minutes. I couldn't say anything. What fascinated me was the actual caption on the box. The caption read, Free me from the oppression of man. And I paused because I thought to myself that that was a summary of a certain demand for freedom that, in fact, would not be the same demand that those who were involved in the American Revolution would actually have. And I'm right as we know, has written extensively about the questions of revolution and the questions of politics, the political relationship to revolution. And she makes, one of the points that she makes is that the French Revolution brings back the idea of the social, puts the social on the table. And by putting the social on the table, it is not just the entrance of the poor peasants of, of, of France, but it's also around questions of rights and citizenship. I have argued, along with others, 
that the Haitian, the Haitian Revolution, which is the oldest successful slave revolution, puts the social back into play as a way in which they also organize it with freedom. And that in putting the social back into play, that it links freedom to notions of equality. I just want to uh, give you one anecdote to show you what I mean. There is a, a series of letters published by Verso Press a couple of years ago of Toussaint Louverture. And in one of the letters, Toussaint Louverture, who is the leader of the revolution, is uh, writes to a colleague of uh, a rebellion, or a rebellion, uh, uh, an incident that has happened, that he rides into the middle of the, of the incident with a very good horseman. And as he rides into that horseman, he tries to tell you the, the, the people are a little upset. They talk to him. And he, you know, he says to them, but you are all free. And he, the people, one person looks at him and says, yes, but there is no equality here. Mm. And therefore, one of the things I want to, 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 to suggest to you, that in the notions that are beginning, that the slave himself or herself are beginning to develop, that we want to think about, is that freedom and equality are, in fact, tied together. And that the issue, therefore, that faces the slave is what is this form of equality? And in this form of, when we think about equality, then we obviously raise the question of the social. Because the social is about a set of human relations within the domain of the economic, and about conditions for human life and the planet. So my argument is that the Haitian Revolution posed this question in colonial modernity. It never fully answered it. It posed this question about what freedom would look like and posed it in relationship to questions of equality. So, just jump fast forward, if you wish, to the anti colonial movement, the anti colonial tradition out of which, the end of which we are all living through today. My argument is that the anti colonial tradition essentially focuses on the political realm, focuses on the nation state focuses when it can on questions of representative institutions and political institutions and on the state itself. That is, it is a focus on the political kingdom. But my argument also is that slavery, colonial and racial slavery, colonialism and apartheid were attempts at social systems of total domination, not just of political domination. That politics was important, but politics was not the only thing. That social systems of domination, by the nature of totality, or attempts to be totality, because never, every, some things are never fully total, that, that attempts to be totality, the systems of that attempt to have total domination, operate through a processes of trying to create subjects, whether they are racialized bodies or whether they are natives. And that, therefore, what occurs in the anti colonial moment is what my colleague David Scott sitting here would call anti-colonial sovereignty. And that this business of anti-colonial sovereignty which then gives us freedom, political freedom, really gives us, if you wish, <coughs> politics as freedom, really is concentrated around the vote. And what happens is that the vote then becomes <coughs> freedom rather than political equality. And it is this business of the vote, seeing the vote as freedom, seeing the vote rather as political freedom rather than as political equality, that then creates, in my view, this particular split where we are, we are concerned about political equality, procedural equality, but we also then ignore, if you wish, the, the questions of the deposits and the traces. So here we are today in a world in which freedom circles, I would argue, around narrow forms of politics, eliding the social. Here we are in a world of growing inequities, here we are in a world in which questions of race and racial domination still operate. They don't operate in the same way as they did 100 years ago, or even 20 or 40 years ago. But to think that they do not operate is actually, I think, a mistake to have an error of fact, as C. L. R. would say in his book, Black Jacobins. So I come back to the question about slavery. Now as a rhetorical device, but rather as a question of historical force. For sure, there is the necessity of a historical narrative in which there are new stories to be told, new identities to be organized through these stories, and new histories to be made 
And certainly within this country, that is so. That is the way in which we have to spend the story about slavery, its relationship to colonialism, uh, its relationship then to apartheid. And that is a, a, a narrative and a story that has to be told. But I also want to suggest that in our so-called post-colonial, post-apartheid worlds, the question that the slave posed, what is freedom? What would it look like? What can it look like? How can we practice it? That that question still echoes in our world. For sure, and of course, we are not slaves of yesterday. And so the freedom that we need is not the emancipation of 19th century and 1834. Yet we live in these close worlds where there is an unsettling feeling that something is not right. And here I want to recall the story of the MPLA and the Angolan Freedom Movement. And this is a story which I think is poignant but very important. NATO is dying. He knows he's dying. So he goes, he begins a journey around the country. That is an Angola. He goes into the villages and he, in the villages, he meets an old woman. And as all the old woman can do, she touches him on his face and says, my son, when is this independence going to finish and freedom start? <laughs> and I've heard that story from many people, girls, you know, and I've always wondered of this actual prominent insight of what it is that she actually makes, the distinction she makes between this old literary woman in the privileges of our world between, if you wish, independence and freedom. I would want to suggest to you that in our present moment, the question is when will our freedom start? What is our kind of freedom? It's posed not just by the slave, but it's posed by the kind of historical processes that we, have, we are in. It is a historical process that began with colonial empires, that began with racial slavery, that connected the world. The Dutch settlement here in the Cape conquered the indigenous population. It began a certain set of African slave, uh, forms of African slavery and slavery in the multinational way. There is the Atlantic slave trade. But all there is, in other words, that colonial empires was about the creation of a network of trade and of people. And therefore, it was also, however, about encounters. And it's in those encounters which created our modern world. But in this encounter, I would argue, and agree with Amy Cesar, that what was created was rather was the process of thingification. By returning to the question that the slave had to pose, not about what kind of freedom he or she will have at a specific moment, but about freedom, we open the door of a different possibility of remapping our world and remapping ourselves. But I would want to argue it is a most complicated task, and perhaps one of the most complicated tasks facing us as a human species today, to understand that question and to begin to reorganize and try to find out how can we live in a more humane world. But perhaps in asking that question and trying to map it and trying to work it and trying to develop practices for it, we may actually call upon our ancestors the slave. Thank you very much. really challenged us, uh, issues around how do we represent uh, the story of slavery from the perspective of the slave, uh, how do we represent the world of the slave, uh, and as you said, history is also about the present, um, so issues of slavery and its relationship to colonialism, uh, issues of uh, slave of racism, so you have from slavery, colonialism, apartheid, what, is, what, what are the traces and deposits? And I think those are issues that to some extent we are grappling with the slave watch. Uh, so really pertinent questions. <coughs> I'd like to just then open the floor to questions uh, for Professor Bogues.
Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the staff at the Zika for bringing together all of us interested in slavery and quite a few scholars here have written about, uh, about the uh, Niamen and uh, so on. So I'm very grateful for, for this initiative. Um, but I really enjoyed your talk. But I want to ask two questions. One, you locate your narrative very strictly within the colonial period. But slavery, of course, precedes the colonial period and precedes it in huge institutions within Africa and the rest of the world. So to locate it within the colonial world, I think it's a little bit one-sided. And then never to mention the abolition of the oceanic slave trade, which is at the height of colonialism. The sculpture behind you is, was, was sculpted in about 1804 by Anton Amrith. It is England at the end of the Napoleonic Wars and just before the abolition of the, slave, of the oceanic slave trade. These things do not find mention in your talk. Why is that? That was a huge intellectual movement, certainly as big as the anti-apartheid movement, successful and successful. And it ended the oceanic slave trade. Then 30 years later, after massive intellectual uh, effort, ended slavery as an institution within the British Empire. Now, I'm not a British descended person. I'm, I'm very much a Cape Horn person. And I have slave ancestry. <laughs> but I'm asking why in your narrative would this not be part of, of a talk on slavery? Ralph Austin has written huge works showing the trans Saharan slave trade before colonialism was equivalent in magnitude to the whole of the transatlantic slave trade. So now why isn't the Middle East part of your, your narrative? Because slaves went from West Africa right to the Middle East. We know that because slave descendants living in Iraq, Iran, the whole of the Middle East, they form no part of your narrative. My question is, why? Can we take another question, please? OK, could I ask the person uh, who was asking the question, could you please just stand? Um, I, I think that <coughs> the question arising from that question is what we mean by success, and that it brings to mind Leto's comment about slavery and freedom and freedom beginning. And I think that the, so. My question would be: talk, if if you could talk a bit about, and, and this is kind of a, an addition or kind of impertinent query or footnote to the last question is the definition of slavery, its temporality. I mean, why stop where the last question stopped? We could go back to classical Athens. Right? So clearly, there's something about relevance and meaning and the construction of that that is a theme that the less argumentative aspects of that question would help us press forward. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me also begin by saying that I reduced, I did not speak about abolition and liberty. I actually took it out of my um, talk because I thought it would actually go on for much too long. Um, I have 30 minutes and it's a disabled thought. So let me say that those are, there are some, those are, there are those are two things. Obviously, and the actual exhibition begins with the statement, all human societies have had slavery. And goes, and goes through it very carefully. But I want to make an argument that colonial slavery created something new in the societies of his, in the history of slavery. And that over a period, a very brief period, colonial societies essentially, essentially created racial slavery. Created a slavery in a way in which being of a different color 
meant that my mission was not possible, or if possible, was very difficult. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson in Notes of Virginia, makes the point very clearly that there is a way, he says, in which slavery operated in Roman times and where the slave could be manumitted. But he says the difficulty we have, and he was speaking both of the English, of the French, and of the Americans, the difficulty we have, he says, is that these people are black and savages, and therefore cannot be integrated into our society. My argument, therefore, is that the construction of race as a marker of slavery, not of anything else, but as race, as a marker of slavery, is something that becomes extremely important and is something that becomes modern. Now, there were other parts of it. You could talk about the Moors and the Spanish and so on. And you could talk all, you know, all them. You could talk about Islam and religion in the Middle East and how, in fact, uh, who was Muslim and who was Muslim and so on. I mean, and there's all of that. And all of that, all that's well documented. But my argument about this is the emergence of race. And that, that emergence of race become ties in with colonialism and colonial power. And slavery then for three or four hundred years is basically essentially organized around a racial system. And that the actual ways in which ideas and practices then develop among human hierarchies, from questions of biology to questions of natural science to questions of nature, that you just have to read these thinkers and you will see that in all of that there is a question of race that is there from Mr. Kant to Mr. Montesquieu to whoever. So I want to make that, I, I want to point that there's a distinction I'm trying to point to and why uh, I talk about colonial modernity is, um, is, is has to do with the question of race. This does not excuse slavery in Africa. It does not. But it marks a certain difference which I think one wants to pay attention to. And I would also like to think that there is a way in which we, we, we kind of lump sometimes these things together. It's okay, there was slavery in Africa and there's slavery in the colonial things. So okay, they're the same thing. Not quite. Not quite. Colonial order became the dominant system in the world. And if you are a dominant system in the world, the way you organize your society and the ideas and practices that emerge have then become very important throughout the entire world and become, if you wish, part of a certain kind of tradition. On the question of abolition, we could argue a lot about this, but I would want to argue, yes, that there was an abolition, and the, 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 the uh, exhibition says it, that the abolitionist movement was perhaps the first transnational movement against slavery. And it's in the world, and it's against slavery, and it included all sorts of people. But again, there are different streams of abolitionism. There are streams of abolitionism. There were people who were white, who were white abolitionists, who supported the end of slavery. But there were also black abolitionists who had a different set of ideas about slavery, and they struggled. Both of them struggle. So to think that, okay, there's just a group of abolitionists and everybody is nice and getting on, that's not quite true. Right? Then you have to think about the, the ways in which something like a Haitian revolution played in the actual abolition, the, 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 the abolition of slavery. The abolition of slavery happened in British colonialism at a very strange moment. It happened in British uh, in, 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 in Britain because, not because, one of the conditions for it, I have argued, is a way in which there was a certain kind of liberal Victorianism that was beginning to develop in England. You just have to read the colonial documents of the documents of the colonial secretaries who were at Oxford, Merville and other people like that, who were lectures in political economy to begin to see a certain set of arguments, not about the end of colonialism, but about the ending of the slave trade. But it was also, quite frankly, also have to do with geopolitical reasons. Mm. When the French ended the slave trade in 1794, 
the Revolutionary National Assembly. Danton, given his speech, said this, we will now fly, we will now throw liberty in the face of the English. Meaning that we will, we, we have situated ourselves within the geopolitics, and of course, and I'm quoting him directly, we are, situ we, are, we are organizing our liberty, and this is after the slaves are revolted in Haiti, we are organizing liberty as part of a geopolitical reason to fight against, as you know, struggles against, against the British and, and then various colonial uh, competition that they have. I argue that there is a colonial slavery and there's colonial and there's racial slavery. Yes, and that there is an abolition movement that ended this. But what is fascinating, I think, is to think about the grounds of the abolitionist movement, the construction of societies after abolition, and the way in which emancipation processes worked, not to free people, but to construct new human beings who were, if you wish, supposed to be respected and who would mimic the actual society, colonial society themselves. I mean, and I don't want to get into, you know, a whole question of the ways in which after emancipation <coughs> all over, the, both, in, both in the Caribbean and in parts of, um, parts of North America until you, get the, the, until you get the collapse of reconstruction, that I'm in this country that the ways in which people like missionaries and so on work to create, to construct human, you know, human beings. And to construct human beings, not on the grounds of, if you wish, them being real human beings, but to, 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 to turn them into something else. My final point in relationship to that is that what is also fascinating is to think about the actual <coughs> abolitionist movement, the processes of, of, of uh, the processes of, um, processes of so-called emancipation and the construction in the British colonial project of somebody that becomes what's called the Creole Negro. And the Creole Negro becomes the black person <coughs> who is able, because he or she has had constant contact with the British Empire, to be a respectable person. And that argument emerges when, when the British are beginning to think about the conquest of Africa of colonial scramble for Africa. Because the distinction that they now need to make to themselves is, OK, what are the differences between these people who are Creole Negroes here, and, what are, and those pe these people who come from, who are Africans, but who don't seem to be, even though they're the same skin color, these Africans over here seem to be different from the Africans in Africa. So that, it's, a, it's a complex story. So it's not just a story about abolition. It is a story about the ways in which colonial power, at a certain moment in time, starting in the 19th century, has to reorganize itself in the Caribbean, primarily, and in South Africa, because the, the, uh, slavery was abolished by the British in the same, the same time, Jamaica, Caribbean, South Africa, same period, same system of apprenticeship, same thing, same thing, same one colonial empire, right? Um, and this is the thing of comparison that I always I, you know, I saw that the, your device chances here. Something I've, I've argued that there's a way in which we need to think about that 18, 18 moment, and I know David Scott does as well, that late 19th century moment between South Africa, between India, between the Caribbean. There's a way in which a set of things are happening, mm -hmm. in which the world is being reorganized, that I think is very, very, that is very important. So that's my response to you. And so I hope I've also answered that, I've also answered your. Question one. <laughs> <laughs> if we ever end, if ever, if we ever feel the land and still we breathe, see the sun, still, still the time must come when we will die and they will be born.